it's prepackaged so you don't have to build any reports yourself. So here's an example of your you know, physicians, how many people you have full time, how many contingent workers, et cetera. Now let's say you said, hey, I had a whole bunch of job posts out. I'm looking for the status of one of them. You can navigate up to the top level menu and we're gonna look at requisitions because they are what job posts you have out. You have a variety of different ones, customer success, you know, customer success representative, sales representative, and so on, different job posts. We're gonna particular pick on sales rep because that's one of the particular roles we're looking for and we've been looking for sales consultants or sales engineers. Now there are different candidates in different stages of the pipeline. All of them made visible to you. If you look in total, we have 15. Three of them are new, seven of them have gone through evaluation, and two are in the final stage. So the three that are new are Michael, Christopher, and Maria. And you see their history, you see you know, their you know, background and where they came from, et cetera. Now you can also say who are the seven that were further along with their evaluation, and you see all the candidates, the timeline on which they were, where and when they had interviews, so you know where they are in the process of completing their, you know, their interview process. Now, what happens if you say, let me look at the two who seem to be in the final stage? So Steve Tomlinson and Maxime are the two in the final stage. Looks like Steve got a rating of 98% score and Maxine got 94%. All the history is right there in the system. And so you say, let me take a look at Steve himself. So you can look at Steve, and right here you have his history, visually presented. He was a sales consultant at another company, at two other companies. You can see from the timeline point of view that he doesn't jump around between jobs all the time. You get a sense of, you know, the, and right there you have all the other history you want about this requisition. So for instance, you want to see who on my team has interviewed Steve, and you see the interviews, the comments, the feedback, and the evaluation, meaning were they positive, negative. If you actually want to see the detailed comments, they're in the system, so you don't have to leave the system to go anywhere else. And then you can go in and say, okay, I want to approve the transaction. So in the same system, we showed you so far three different things. The ability to do transactions, promote people, hire people, approve a requisition. We showed you a business process, the employee onboarding requisition business process. And I showed you reporting in the same system. There's a collaboration tool built in there. So if you wanted to ask one of your colleagues who made a comment, why were you so positive or negative about the person, you don't need to go to email. You can post it directly within the system and they reply back and it looks like Facebook, okay? Now, you can also look at career development in the same system. So every one of your employees, you can see their career goals. They can set their own objectives if that's the style of your organization or if the manager set the development objectives, both are possible, okay? Now, the same system can be used, so if you look at Jen Jacobs, one of my team members, I can look down at her goals and see which ones she's completed. So for example, if you said somebody needs to learn how to do database programming and they need to go to a class on advanced database fundamentals, you can actually track that active goal without having to call the person and say, hey, did you go to that class and can you now write you know, PL SQL? Right? You can do that right in the same system. It depends on what goals you want to give them. And so this, the goal that we have with HR is that it's a system that's used by employees to develop their skills. It's used by managers to collaborate with them, and it becomes a living system that is not just used once or twice a year when people have to look at their payroll slip or submit their benefits program. Now, lastly, if you're a manager, one of the important things we do is within the system, we give you analytics, an enormous number of different kinds of analytics, They're close to 1,200 reports built for HR professionals in the system. You can look at performance and potential, 
You can look at your demographics. And so in the same system, in this modern application, you have deep functionality. It combines transaction processing, analytics, collaboration, and business process management. And therefore, we're making it dramatically simpler for users to use these applications. What do you need to use this application? A mobile phone, or a tablet, or a browser. That's it. Here are some customers who are using these applications to run their HR systems, to develop their employees, and to recruit and staff new team members into their organization. Next area is CRM. So in CRM, our basic view was the following. Customers want to have a central system of record for customer data. That's customer master data management. On top of which, they wanted to have seven or eight different business processes. They want to take that customer master and use it to segment their customer base and then drive marketing campaigns to reach people through the web, on social media channels, push notifications to their mobile devices, on YouTube, and a variety of other digital channels, multi-channel marketing. From those campaigns, they want to bring qualified leads. If you're a retailer or in B2C, you bring qualified leads to your e-commerce system. If you're in a traditional selling organization, you can bring qualified leads to your sales teams into Salesforce automation. A person comes online, they, for example, in the e-commerce system, they can transact online. Or if it's a more complex product, they can go through a configuration, pricing, and coding process. Your sales teams, you can manage your sales teams, assign them territories, manage your forecast, your leads, opportunities, et cetera, manage incentive compensation. After they make an order, we capture the order and can kick off order management. And then we can offer customer service on the web, in social media, through telephone support, or via email and chat. If you're an organization that ships equipment, for example, you're a cable television company and you ship modems to people, we can also dispatch technicians with field service to repair things. So all of this in one customer experience platform. And here are examples of customers who use our customer experience platform to modernize how they engage with customers and transform the customer service experience. Now, we are announcing today general availability of a new set of capabilities in our cloud, the Oracle supply chain and manufacturing suite of applications. So what this allows you to do, if you're a manufacturing company, is to design new products and services, to put them up on order management so that customers can order them. When customers go to order them, you need to plan both how much demand you're likely to see and how much supply you're likely to need to provide. Planning. When you plan, you have to procure parts in order to manufacture things. That's called direct procurement. So we used to have, prior to release 11, of our SaaS suite, we used to have indirect procurement, which is procuring things like pencils, papers, and computers. We've added direct procurement, so you can buy parts to manufacture things. Then you can actually manufacture things with our manufacturing suite, discrete manufacturing. You can fulfill, so you can handle logistics, warehouse management, and then billing to customers, and then allocation of cost. So we can do the entire thing from design, order, planning, procuring, manufacturing, shipping, fulfilling, warehousing, and then costing. And so it's a brand new capability, bringing software as a service 
to the entire manufacturing and supply chain industry. And our manufacturing piece adds to a supply chain solution that's been available for a variety, number of releases. And here are people using our supply chain suite in the cloud. Now, one of the important things we did when we started software as a service, we said we're gonna build an integrated suite covering these six areas. Enterprise performance management, ERP, HR, CRM, supply chain manufacturing. Here are examples of companies that use multiple pieces of our suite. So HR, ERP, or ERP, CRM, or ERP, you know, supply chain. And so many, many companies say, I, you know, I, it's really complicated for me to have to stand up multiple systems of record. One system for ERP, another system for HR, from a different vendor. Then if I move people from one department to another, I got to make all the cost center changes, which means I have to go into HR, make some changes, then build an integration to ERP, and then go and deal with that. Having an integrated suite with a single data model and a single set of business processes means you don't have to do any of that. That's all done in the software for you. You get to run your business processes, whether it's order to cash, procure to pay, lead to fulfill, and the software takes care of all of those pieces. So that's the SaaS suite. Since October, we have introduced a number of new modules. Here's examples of them. And so there's a continuously evolving breadth of capability that we're delivering. And here's a number of different capabilities we've delivered just since October. So that's one way you can use our cloud. The second way you can use our cloud is as our platform as a service. So what are we doing with platform as a service? It's relatively simple. We want to offer customers three important capabilities. An integrated platform based on standards that provide a breadth of capability to build and run cloud-based applications, number one. Number two, to automate a number of manual tasks that people have to do to install, configure, backup, patch, monitor, administer this platform. And by automating that through software, by automating that through software, we dramatically lower the cost that people have to use spend in order to administer the Oracle system and also make it much, much more efficient uh, to spin up applications on top of this platform. Third, we also provide capabilities to elastically scale up and down these platform components. Uh, and it gives you things like availability, domains, so you can handle fault tolerance, et cetera. There are eight of these areas that we're focused on. Data management, which is managing your data. Application development, building new applications, or lifting and shifting existing applications. Business intelligence or analytics. Big data, which is Hadoop and a set of technologies around that. Mobility, being able to deliver applications to mobile devices. Content, collaboration, integration, and system management. So it's a big breadth of capability and continues to have new services rolled out. I'll walk through a few of these and then show you what we mean when we say all the manual work that you have to do has been automated through software. Okay? So data management is the first area. We offer Oracle database in the cloud. You can run Oracle database enterprise edition or you can run something we call Extreme Performance Edition, which includes all of the features of the Oracle database. Encryption, partitioning, clusters, disaster recovery, everything's auto-configured for you, and I'll show you that, which will show you how easy it is to get a system up and running. We're introducing Oracle's MySQL open source database in the cloud, 
as well as NoSQL. You can manage these environments in the cloud, or if you're a customer with a big Oracle estate and you have on-premise Oracle databases, you can also monitor your Oracle cloud databases in the cloud from your on-premise Oracle Enterprise Manager. So you have a single pane of glass to look and manage not just your on-premise systems, but your cloud systems. For application development, we support three styles of application development. If you're a hardcore programmer, we allow it to use a development source control system based on GitHub, plus Maven, plus um, continuous integration, and a collaboration set of tools. So you can, use, you can put source control in our cloud if you want to. You can build applications in Java EE, Java SE, Ruby on Rails, Python, Node, PHP, JavaScript. So any popular programming language you can use to build applications in our cloud if you're a programmer. If you want to build applications for mobile devices, let's say you have Oracle eBusiness Suite and you say, hey, I'd really like to take it and enable it for Android and iOS devices, you can use our mobile cloud service. It'll run against iOS, Android, as well as Windows Surface devices. Third, if you're a non-technical developer, meaning you're a person who likes to build applications but you want to drag and drop, assemble applications rather than write low-level code, we offer something called Application Builder, which lets you get applications built quickly in a browser. Here are customers who use our database cloud. Here are customers who build applications in our cloud. Analytics. Suppose you said, hey, I'm a departmental person in an organization. I don't have access to the corporate data warehouse, but I need to do some analysis. We support two styles of analysis. The first one is for people who are comfortable running and aggregating data into a database. So you can simply say, I want to stand up an Oracle instance in the cloud. I'll show you how easy that is. You can use Oracle Data Integrator to load data into that instance. And you can use Oracle Business Intelligence in the cloud. You do not have to run anything on, you don't need a server, you don't need anything else. All you need is a browser or a smartphone, and you can access Oracle Analytics in the cloud. Now we've also introduced a new product called Oracle Data Visualization Cloud. That's meant for people who are true end users. The premise behind that application was something very simple. An end user should be able to do analytics. If they have a browser and they know how to use Excel to load data. Again, if you have a browser and you know how to use Excel to load data, you can build analysis in a cloud. It's a very, very simple environment to load data using Excel or comma separated value files. You can mash that data up from multiple sources in a browser-based interface. You do not, as an end user, have to know SQL. You do not have to manage a database. All the data is running in memory, and the calculations are being done in memory for you. So we support, as I said, two different styles of analytics users. Departmental analytics users or corporate data warehouses in the cloud, or true end users. And here are customers who span the breadth of these okay, in our cloud. If you want, suppose you're an organization that's got the documents and you want to share them between your users and people travel overseas and they want three capabilities. I want a secure repository to put documents, which is just for your company or your organization and it's not you know, shared outside. Number two, you want enterprise file sync and share. So when I publish a document into it, anybody in that work group gets notified there's a new document, and then it automatically syncs the documents onto your devices, your phones, your tablets, your PCs. Uh, so you don't have to sh push those documents up through iCloud or something of that kind, but you can push them securely from this repository, which is designed for your organization. 
and it gives you the ability to collaborate, create work groups, share documents securely, and get enterprise file sync and share. We have a social network that sits on top of it where you can collaborate, and you can also build very simple and quick and easy to use websites. Now, if you're a company that's got some presence on premise and some presence in the cloud, we offer three capabilities to integrate the two. First is identity management. In our cloud, we have one place where all users are managed and where they get single sign-on. You can also synchronize that through SAML or OAuth with your on-premise directory. So if somebody leaves your organization on-premise, they're automatically revoked from the cloud. So centralized security and identity management. We have an integration platform which allows you to connect cloud applications with your on-premise systems. And we have also a process cloud which allows you to design very simple and easy workflows that link your cloud to on-premise systems. Now, let me show you. You probably said, okay, that's a lot of capability on the platform. How difficult is that going to be for me to use? So I thought I would show you if you had an Oracle Cloud account, how you create a database. Okay, so this is your login screen. You can come in and sign in. Now, when you sign in, you can pick the service you want. And I picked Oracle Database Cloud Service, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to create a database. So when you log in, it says, okay, do you want to pick, I want to create a database. There are two ways to create a database. One is to use the cloud service, or the second is to say, just give me a binary image and I'll create it. We're going to use the cloud service. You can pick your billing frequency, which is hourly or monthly. We're going to pick monthly, but if you want to pay by the hour, you can pay by the hour. You get two versions to choose from, 11 or 12. We're going to pick 12. There are three choices of addition. Enterprise edition is vanilla enterprise. High performance has a bunch of advanced capability, and extreme performance has everything. So we're going to pick extreme performance to see if it can set up everything for us, which includes a real application cluster, full data encryption, disaster recovery with data guard. Everything is configured. Okay, so now that you've done that, we're going to ask you for some configuration information. You get to name your instance. You get to describe it if you want to search for it. You tell us how many cores and how many CPUs, how much memory you need. You give us a public key that we use for SSH access or secure shell access. You can upload that from your desktop. We can also generate the key for you if you want, but we're just showing you if you want to load it, you can load it. You can tell us the size of how much storage you need. You can give us an administrator password, confirm it, and then we ask you for some backup information. Okay, you can tell us, hey, I'm using this for test and dev. I really don't care for a backup. Or you can say, I just want a local backup. Or you can say, I want it backed up into my object store because I want a durable backup. Now, if you say you want it backed up in the object store, you obviously have to give us the identity of the container where you're going to put it. It's your backup location. And you have to give us the password in order to be able to put it into the backup location. At the end of that, we ask you, hey, please confirm, just like you do on Amazon's shopping cart, saying, are you sure you want to buy all this stuff? You say, here's a confirmation screen. And then we create it. Now, when we create it, I want to make sure we are clear. There's not, it's not that there's an Oracle DBA sitting in the cloud that receives this information and runs off to create this. It's done through software. Okay? So why is that important? Every Oracle database in the cloud is created exactly the same. If you tell us you need a two-node Oracle Real Application Cluster, 100% of the time, it is created exactly the same way. The reason that's important is if you're running a bunch of test, dev, prod environments, you don't spend all your time debugging why is it different in this environment than that environment. 
Secondly, it takes about 20, 25 minutes to create one of these instances for you. Okay, and you will get, so right now I've got my MyCloud database. If you notice, it's got a public IP address, which means it's internet routable. If you say, I don't want a public IP address, it won't give you a public IP address, in which case you can only access it through a, your own virtual corporate network. It tells you how many OCPUs are there, how much memory. Now, just think about the workloads running fine, and then you're going to a quarter close. And you say, oh my God, I need to scale it up. You don't have to buy hardware, rush off, network it, attach storage to it. You simply come in and specify an elastic scaling policy, and it'll scale it up for you. After you're done with it, not only does it scale up, but we can also scale it back down. So after the last four days of the quarter, when things quieten down, if you want to scale it down, exactly the same way, it scales back down. So it's fully scalable up and down. Remember I said we can back up, automate the backup. We have the facility to configure, I'm not gonna show it to you, but you get a calendar. And on the calendar you can specify three things. When you want incremental backups taken, which is a nightly backup. When you want full backups taken, so you can say, hey, my workloads typically go quiet 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 p.m. Eastern time. So every night at 10 p.m. I want it taken. And once a week on Saturday nights, I want a full backup taken. And you can also say for patches, patch me, notify me there are new patches, but patch it automatically for me on the last Friday of the month, whatever is your preference. That's automatically done for you. We not only do the backup, but we show you the catalog. So if you say, oh, my instance got messed up, I want to actually restore from that backup, you can go in and simply pick the backup you want to restore and then bring it back up. So what we've done with the database as a service is automate the entire process of creating, configuring, patching, backing up, monitoring Oracle. And so what, every part of our platform works the same way. And by automating it, we're bringing this technology to all those people and all those applications that wanted to use it, but did not have the skill set or the resources to use it. So that's the platform. Infrastructure is the next piece. So what are we doing with infrastructure as a service? We have a very simple view what customers want and what we're delivering is a software-defined virtual data center in the cloud. So what's really happened with hardware and software is that they've come together or converged. And what we mean by that is storage or compute or network can now be created removed, allocated, configured through an API just like a software program. And so what we've done is we've taken a software-defined set of resources, compute, storage, and network, and created a software-based virtual data center in the cloud. And I'll show you that because it will show you how quick and easy you can spin things up uh, for if you want some storage, how you can spin it up. If you want some compute, I'll show you how you can do that. Now, we support different styles of compute. Okay? If you want a bare metal server, you say, hey, I just want a bare metal server, and I want to run Windows or Linux on it. I want to install it. You can do that. If you want elastic compute, which is I want a set of hypervisor nodes and I want to run inside that Linux, Windows, Debian, you know, CentOS, Ubuntu, or Solaris, you can spin it up as elastic compute. Now, if you say, hey, I really like that, but I'm thinking of putting PeopleSoft or eBusiness Suite into the cloud, and I really don't want to share my compute with somebody else, you can, same API, same programming model, 
same elastic resource, but you can ask for dedicated compute, which says, I want a rack of servers that I can elastically access to install my e-business suite on it, but I don't want anyone else on it. And so that's dedicated to you. I'll talk about Docker in a minute. And we also offer Oracle's engineered systems, Exadata as a service and Big Data as a service. So you get all of these different styles of compute. And they're designed for different types of workload. For storage, we support object storage. So if you want to back up your database or your files and put them into the cloud so that you get a durable backup very cost effectively, you can do that with object storage. Archival is the ability to put objects into the cloud for long-term archive. The, you know, the, the difference between object storage and archival is in object storage, you have a recovery time objective, meaning you need it back in case if it's a backup, hey, I need to restore from it. For archival, I just want to put it there. I know it's guaranteed to be there, but I don't need to get it back within a certain period of time. File and database backup, you can use any common file backup tool, semantic net backup, Commvault, Oracle database, RMAN, and you can put objects, put your backups into the cloud. Cloud NAS says, if I put my stuff into the cloud, but on premise I have a set of applications that speak NFS or WebDAV or SMB, some protocol like that, can I make those objects look to these applications as though they're NFS? And we provide a mechanism to do that. And lastly, bulk data transfer is, I have a huge amount of stuff. We had a customer move 240 petabytes into our cloud. They said, we just don't want to stream it up over the network. We're going to just ship you a, a network-attached storage device. You back it up to it. We'll move it physically, meaning through FedEx. We'll move it, unpack it, and load your data. Okay, so there's a variety of different kinds of storage. Now, with a customer move their Oracle eBusiness Suite backups to the cloud into the archive. They have a 70 terabyte instance of eBusiness Suite, okay? The price of the archive is a dollar a terabyte a month, okay? So $12 a terabyte a year. So if they were taking eBusiness Suite backup, 70 terabytes is $840. If they want to take every night a full backup of the entire thing and put it there every night for a month, it would be $54,000. Okay, that's about a thousand times cheaper than what people pay on premise. And you get 99.99995% guarantee that you don't lose your data. Okay, so you can use storage if you like. Now, you may think, what about if I want to connect my corporate network to your cloud? You can do it in four different ways. You can do traditional site-to-site -site IPsec VPN. You can do software-based VPN. And then we have two offerings called Cloud Connect. Suppose you have a huge amount of data that you need to put up there. Running that through a VPN tunnel becomes a problem because bandwidth on the VPNs typically are about two megabits per second. You can buy an offering called Oracle Cloud Connect. Uh, Cloud Connect is basically you can run your traffic from your data center into a cloud without it having to traverse the public internet. It goes either through a dedicated line or through an MPLS circuit, which means that because the traffic is not running on the public internet, many people are comfortable running it without VPN, which means you can get 10 gigabits per second down into the cloud. Okay, so there's a variety of different types of network connectivity offerings that optimize not just security, but also speed and bandwidth. Now, you can use this infrastructure to automate your dev test process. You can have your developers build applications in any one of these languages, check them into Git or Subversion. At the end of that process, after you get a successful build, you kick off a continuous integration process using Jenkins or Hudson. You can spin up, you know, you put your binary into our object store. 
and then you can spin up compute using our compute API. Lastly, if you're a hardcore Docker fan, Docker is a portable container technology that spans multiple cloud providers. You can do the same. You go through Jenkins and Hudson, create a Docker image, put that in our image registry, and then you can use two technologies, either Mesos or an open source technology called Kubernetes to spin up Docker in our environment. And there's lots of customers doing that too. We support, on top of infrastructure as a service, a large number of open source technologies. So it doesn't rest on Oracle stuff. It can run any kind of stuff. As I said, it runs Windows or Linux or Unix. So you can run any operating system. And then we've also got a marketplace where there's a variety of different images published. Let's show you what we mean by a software-defined virtual data center. So I'm going to log in. When I log in, I can create a project. Okay, projects define a set of resources associated with a particular project. So we're building an e-commerce system. And so the name of it was the front-end server piece. So you define your quota, how much block store and how much compute quota you need, and then you can create instances. Let's say you said, hey, from my corporate network into the Oracle Cloud, I want access over VPN, you can create a VPN tunnel. You simply go name your VPN network, give us your shared public key because we need to use it to encrypt the traffic, and we created a VPN for you, okay? So here's your VPN. Now all those front end servers you're creating, you want to put them on a virtual network so they can load balance across the virtual network, and you want that virtual network accessible from a public IP because front end traffic is gonna to go to those web servers from the public internet. So how do you do that? You simply specify that you need a virtual network, you specify the subnet range, whether you want a default internet gateway address, and then the IP address range that you want, and we'll create the virtual network for you. So we just did that. It's called the front end network. Now on that front end network, you're gonna now attach different kinds of instances. So you can attach your database service that I created earlier, but I'm gonna show you what it is to create a compute instance, which is a raw Linux guest. Okay, so I go in and I'm gonna pick, I pick compute and it asks you a variety of things. It asks you pick the operating system you want to boot with. You can use Oracle Linux, Red Hat, uh, Windows, you know, variety of things. We're gonna pick Oracle Linux. You can then specify the instance shape, and you can name your instance, label it. If you wanna tag it as this is my dev instance, so later on you wanna search for where's my dev thing, you can add your tag. You can give it a set of SSH keys, I'm not gonna go through all of it. At the end you get a confirmation screen, and then we're gonna create the instance. Now once you created it, you may add your own patches to it. You have shell access to it. You can add your own patches to it. You can make any config changes you want. And then you say, hey, you know, this is my perfected instance. So you can either, you can start it, stop it, do whatever you like. But let's say you say, I want to take a snapshot of this. The reason you want to take a snapshot is, I spent all this time perfecting this instance. And any new instance I create, I want to make it look exactly like this instance. So you can say, I want to take a snapshot, in which case we'll take a snapshot and save that snapshot for you. You can choose to then say, what I'd really like to do with that snapshot is make it a new image so that my subsequent compute environments that I boot, I'm going to use that snapshot because I spent all this time perfecting it. So you can then say, I want to take that snapshot and I'm going to create an image. So we just did. We created an image called Snapshot 1 and it's not the standard Oracle Linux that Oracle booted off, but the perfected thing that you did, whatever it was that you did with it. So I'm going to create an image. I name it and then I can save it. Now, 
I'm going to create a new compute image. So when I create a new compute image, you can say, in addition to using Linux, SUSE, et cetera, you see that sign top images? You, can, you would see image one in that, and you could say, hey, I've got a private image called image one, which is just for me. It's not a public image that everybody else is able to access. I perfected it, and what I want to do to boot from is now use this private image to boot from. Okay, so I'm going to use that same process after that. And I'm going to create a second VM called VM2. I review it, I attach it, things are running now. So I have VM1, VM2, VM3. Now, let's assume that you've got workload that you want to distribute across these. So that's where the load balancer comes in. It's a software-based elastic load balancer. We call it the front-end SSL load balancer. You can terminate SSL at the load balancer. So that subsequent traffic from the load balancer down to those compute guests just go HTTP. Or you can say, I want it all the way down. In this case, we're going to terminate SSL at the load balancer. So I've got to specify the public keys that I want to use for crypto to terminate traffic at the load balancer. I specify a variety of other you know, configuration things, and a load balancer is created. Now, we're going to come in and show you something called orchestration. Orchestration is basically, think of it as a script or a program that creates resources, okay? And can spin up and down based on events that are happening within the system. And why did I create an orchestration? I created an orchestration in order to do elastic scaling, and I'll show you that in a minute. So I created an orchestration, it's just a script you can write orchestrations as simply a JSON file, okay? It's just a metadata file that says what you want done. Now I'm gonna create that as a template. So I take that orchestration, make it a template, and then I can tie that template using a rule system to specific metrics. Okay, so why is that important? I had three VMs. Two of them are running actively. And then I have a metric called CPU usage. Do you see that top graph? I can set a simple policy that says, if CPU goes above a certain thing, then kick off an orchestration, which means auto scale. And what does it do when it auto scales? It brings in Virtual Machine 3, and it adds it into the load balancer pool. So you can say, attach it in, and then if the workload goes below a certain amount, take it out, so I don't want to keep paying for it, okay? So here are the ways you specify the thresholds and rules, and so you can say on a threshold like CPU, if it goes above a certain number, send me a notification and take an action like run template. So if you're a control fanatic, you can say, I don't want you to auto scale me, just send me a notification, I want to go and kick off the process myself. Or if you're more easy going, you can say, take care of it for me because I don't like to receive notifications in the middle of the night. Okay, and we support both. So these are the rules. Now you can also create a storage instance. Why would you want to create a storage instance? To put a backup. So remember we were building this e-commerce site? You want to copy an on-premise database and a set of files in because you had all your images and your product catalog on-premise. How do you do that? You create a storage instance, you can attach the storage instance to the same virtual network so it's accessible from the compute guests. You create a storage container. You can add that storage container into that same network. And then this is semantic net backup. As I said, Oracle Cloud is literally a target in semantic net backup. So if you bring it up, you will see down in the middle, here are the different types of backup targets. And then Oracle Public Cloud is one of those backup targets. And you can use the standard semantic net backup functionality to back stuff up, files. You can specify your service host, your storage name, media server name, your access keys. And then you can schedule all your backups into the cloud using that. You can also do the same with Oracle RMAN, okay, recovery manager for the Oracle database. So here are examples of people doing infrastructure as a service. 
And what did I show you with infrastructure as a service? I showed you something really simple. You didn't have to buy a server. You didn't have to buy a network. You didn't have to go and allocate IP addresses. You didn't have to allocate storage. Everything was done. I showed you a GUI to make it easy for people to understand, but every piece of what I showed you is as accessible as a REST API so that you can script against it. So you can go in and say, what I really need is a software-defined virtual data center in the cloud. I start by allocating a virtual network, attaching to that virtual network compute resources, load balancers, storage, whatever you like, you know, even our pass. And then you can elastically scale out and down, and it's all done programmatically through software. Okay, so imagine you wanted to spin up a dev test project. That's exactly your experience. If you want to stand up e-business suite or a production workload, same experience, except you may ask for more capacity potentially, but it's the same programmatic access to software-defined resources. Now, we've introduced a lot of new PaaS and IaaS services over the last four months. The variety of things. Imagine you had Oracle database in the cloud, Oracle database on-prem. You want to replicate data from on-prem into the cloud without taking any downtime. We've introduced Golden Gate as an example, as a service, so that you can replicate transactions from prem into the cloud and then move your database into the cloud without taking any downtime. That's an example of just one of the many new services we've introduced. Now, most importantly today, though, we have a big announcement. Historically, people have asked us, hey, I really like your cloud services. I like your infrastructure as a service. I like your platform as a service. But for regulatory reasons, for legislative reasons, in many countries of the world, they say data has to sit in our own country. It cannot leave the country's boundaries. How can I use your cloud? Now, prior to this, if you went to any vendor in the market, they said, we have a cloud stack which runs in our cloud, and you have an on-premise stack that runs on your prem. They called it sometimes private cloud, but the two were not the same thing. They were not the same APIs. They were not the same software. So imagine you said, I want to spin up a workload on my premise in a private cloud. You had a totally different set of APIs, totally different set of tools, totally different management interface. Now, today what we're announcing is that the exact same software, exact same software that runs our cloud is now available on customers' data center floors. Exact same software. So Oracle Infrastructure as a Service and Oracle Platform as a Service is now available in your data center. Same software, same APIs. Because it's the same software, because it's the same APIs, it gives you the ability to get seamless workload portability. And I will show you an example. It addresses customer concerns, business concerns. You know, our board of directors is just not ready yet to go to the cloud. Legislative concerns, our industry just has a set of regulations that say you can't put workload into the cloud, or statutory or regulatory requirements, our country's policies just don't let us do that today. Even on your premise, this, you're buying a cloud service. You're not buying hardware. So you get subscription-based pricing and elastic metered pricing. In fact, what's the price for database as a service on your premise using our new offering? exactly the same as database as a service in the Oracle Cloud. What's your pr price for Java Cloud service on your premise? Exactly the same as the Java Cloud service in the Oracle Cloud. 
So it's the exact same price point. Now, what constitutes Oracle Cloud behind your firewall? Obviously, when you run it on your floor, it needs a hardware box. It runs our infrastructure as a service software. It runs our platform as a service software. And we give you a set of capabilities to manage this environment, which I'll discuss. So the hardware box, you can buy in three different configurations. Model 288, surprisingly, that stands for 288 Intel X5 cores. Okay, 576. 576 Intel X5 cores. And 1080 is 1080 Intel X5 cores. So there's different sizes. They have local SSD, meaning solid state disk, as well as local NAS disk, and the standard you know, 10 gigabit Ethernet Cisco switch within the hardware rack. So to the rest of your data center, it just looks like a, a standard x86 rack, it runs Linux, Oracle Linux. It's got local disk with SSD, network attached storage, okay? Now on top of that, it runs Oracle's infrastructure as a service software. So it runs Elastic Compute, block storage. It runs the network software I showed you, load balancer, et cetera. And there are more services as well available. Identity management is integrated, access management is integrated, there's a messaging service so that you can send and receive asynchronous messaging, et cetera. The PaaS, Oracle Database as a Service, is available on this. You can build applications in Java as well as other languages. We offer our integration service, which is the service bus that allows you to connect your on-premise systems with the cloud. Now, our goals are to roll out all of the PaaS and IaaS services, and we're also gonna bring additional styles of hardware to you. Exadata, cloud service will be available. Big data, cloud service will be available behind your firewall. How do you manage this? So we have a catalog. Remember I showed you when we created an image? I saved that image as a boot image. We have a standard list of images that are available in the public cloud that includes eBusiness Suite and PeopleSoft and JD Edwards and lots and lots of people are writing those images. Those same images can be used to boot your on-premise. Okay, so if you perfected that image in the cloud, you can also use it to boot your on-premise compute environments using the same images. So you can share the service catalog between the on-premise system and the cloud. You can also manage this environment as though it's an extension to the cloud using Enterprise Manager and a variety of services. And lastly, identity management can be centralized across the two environments. So what's available now is not just a box running infrastructure service platform as a service, but it's also fully managed on your data center floor by Oracle Cloud Operations. So we're making it really easy for you. The price is the same, it's in your data center, and you don't have to train people if you don't want to, to manage this, because our people administer it. So it's truly a cloud service. It's not a box that we're requiring to buy and then have to train your admins to manage it. Our people administer it just like in the cloud. And you pay for it as a subscription service, or as a metered service. We're gonna do the same with Oracle Database Cloud Service Exadata Edition later this year and Big Data Cloud Service. Now let's show you this and then wrap up, okay? So I have an application scenario. I have a database in the cloud, database on-prem. I want to create a set of middle tiers in the cloud and middle tiers on-prem and I'm going to burst workload from prem to the cloud. So my typical workload is on prem, but I want elastic capacity in the cloud in case I have an enormous quarter, right? So if the stack of software was not literally the same, you literally could not do that. So let's show you that. 
I'm going to start by creating a virtual private network from on-prem to the cloud. I did that. Now, I'm going to take a backup of my cloud database. Remember, we created a database as a service in the cloud earlier, my MyCloud database. I'm going to take a backup of that, of my on-premise thing, and I'm going to instantiate a database using that backup. Why is that important? Because I want to synchronize my data from prem to the cloud. So when you create an instance in the cloud, you can choose to either create a vanilla instance or you can cre choose to create it off a backup that you've taken from prem. So I just did taking a backup on the prem and then I instantiated in the cloud. So now my two databases look identical. Okay, now, third. So I now have my database. I'm going to go and create a Java cloud service instance. Okay, how do you create a Java cloud service instance? Exactly the same as database cloud service. You go through a sequence of screens where we ask you, do you want Java cloud service? Definitely yes. Three different editions. We're gonna pick the more sophisticated one. You're gonna get different questions that are service configuration related. Okay, some of them are name my instance, give it a description, give it a username, password, how many cores do you need, et cetera. Because the Java cloud service needs to be connected to the database, because the backend database is where all the transactions run, I also need to give it the database config. I specify my load balancer config, push my public keys for VM access, so that I can publish the, you know, and then specify the web logic, username, password. And once you go through that process, so I just specify database config, load balancer, uh, how, what kind of load balancing policy do I need, network, backup, I'm done with creating the Java cloud. It gives me my configuration screen, so far so good, and it says, great, I'm gonna create one in the cloud. So now I have a database in the cloud created off a backup from prem. I have a Java cloud service set up in the cloud that's a cluster of WebLogic servers. That's for spillover capacity. Now I'm going to show you how it is to deal with Oracle Cloud Machine on prem. So I load my application in the cloud, I test it, I perfect it. I can lift and shift it back with a set of tools that we provide to my on-premise Oracle cloud machine. Okay, now, now I'm gonna show you something deliberately boring. How do you create Java cloud service on the Oracle cloud machine on your premise? It looks exactly the same because it is exactly the same as in the cloud. So I come in and say, hey, I'd like to create Java cloud service on my prem. Now you're going through the same UI, same API, same software, except it's on your floor. So say, I'd like to create Java cloud service, pay for it hourly, monthly. My goodness, I'd like to use the same version of WebLogic I did it before. I'm gonna pick Enterprise Edition. I specify the same, literally the same parameters and then I'm done. Okay, so what's important is it's literally the same code. That's the only way you can guarantee portability. Okay, now, here is Enterprise Manager, Oracle Middleware Control as part of Enterprise Manager. In it, I can see not just my cloud machine down below, but my Oracle Cloud in the cloud. Now I want to specify load balancer because remember I said I want to burst up. So I create a load balancer. I go to enterprise manager and specify a performance policy. So here it is. It says, here's my performance policy. I'm gonna specify what the policy and what happens when the policy reaches a certain threshold. And if you specify that, you can burst from your prem to the cloud. 
and here is the workload being distributed. So the thing I want to make sure you understand is it's the same software, the same public cloud software available as a cloud service on your floor. It's, we are the only vendor whose behind the firewall solution is exactly the same as in the cloud solution, thereby giving you portability. And that allows every company and every organization, even if you're concerned about privacy, security, legislative requirements, statutory requirements to be able to go to our cloud. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Research Vice President, IDC, Melanie Posey. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Oracle for inviting me to talk to you briefly to give you an idea of some of the key industry trends we at IDC are seeing going forward. And my coming right after Thomas is fortuitous because he talked a lot about hybrid IT, and that's the subject of my talk as well. Hybrid IT, living in a multi-cloud world. At IDC, we talk a lot about digital transformation and how digital transformation is enabling new approaches to IT. In some ways, it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Is the new technology enabling the di digital transformation, or is the digital transformation requiring different types of technology to deliver new types of experiences to customers? At IDC, we talk a lot about the third platform as being the foundation for this process of digital transformation. I'd like to take a minute just to talk about what the third platform is. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about what the first platform is. That's mainframes, that whole era of very static siloed IT, which we got a little better with in the second platform where we had a more distributed client-server approach to things. But the third platform takes everything to a new level where it's highly distributed, highly scalable, and you're talking about an IT environment that supports not tens of thousands or thousands or even millions of users. We're talking about billions of users at this point, and not just end users. We're talking about all kinds of endpoints, devices, people, other machines. And the pillars of the third platform, there are four of them. There's social business, there's big data and analytics, there's mobility, and then, of course, the center of everybody's universe here, there's cloud. And what cloud does is gives you the ability to have the flexibility, have the scalability to build new applications and create new business value with new types of business models and new types of business relationships. And those new business models and new business relationships are increasingly enabled by the technology platforms and the API calls that link those technology platforms together. And on top of those four pillars, we also have what we call at IDC innovation accelerators. And I won't tax your eyesight by asking you to read each of them. I'll just name a couple of them. And some of those innovation accelerators that live on top of the third platform are things like cognitive analytics, pervasive robotics, natural interfaces like touch and voice and eyesight. These are some of the things that can be used to innovate even further on top of the agility that the third platform gives you. And in this world where there are all of these technology capabilities available, and there are all of these different expectations from customers in terms of how you engage with them, how you interact with them, how you're not just selling them a product, you're selling them an experience, and you're selling them lots of services around those products, and those services require 
use of different types of endpoints and the ability to get data anywhere, anytime, from any device. These new rules for business also determine how you have to develop, how your operations have to go. You have to develop services and products faster. You have to innovate faster, and you have to be more resilient and reliable in your operations. As your business becomes digital, as your transformation requires that digital delivery and consumption approach, the technology piece is really important, and the way you go about it and who you choose to go about that with is highly important. And at IDC, since we're an industry analyst firm, we love data. So here's an example of something that is from our most recent CloudView survey, where we're looking at what is the enterprise view on cloud. And this is from a worldwide survey of about 12,000 respondents. And from this, you can see that over half of respondents are already embracing the cloud. And what we mean by embracing the cloud is you're using two or more cloud services on a pretty consistent basis. So let's drill down a little bit into that and see how they're using the cloud. There's public cloud, the AWS, Azure, Google that we all hear about. But the interesting thing that a lot of people sometimes don't realize is that there's about as much private cloud usage out there as there is public cloud. And then there's this section in the middle where people are saying they're using both. And what that both is, is a hybrid IT environment where public, private, on-prem, off-prem are used together in concert to deliver the right resources for the right workload at the right time. I'll drill down on this a little bit more to take a look at what types of private cloud are being used. And from what you can see here, there's an equal interest in using private cloud on-prem as using it hosted in a third-party environment, exactly the kind of environment that Thomas just described with Oracle Cloud Machines. And this is another view of what's going on in the industry as far as how enterprises are evolving their IT to take advantage of some of the new capabilities. And in this graphic, what we asked the respondents was, how are you allocating your IT budget now, and what's it gonna look like two years from now across these different types of IT? And the quick version of this is that you see a reduction in traditional IT, whether that's traditional in-house IT or IT outsourcing, the kind of big outsourcing we've seen from IBM and, and Accenture and the like. And what we're seeing is that's still going to be around because at the end of the day, the trend is unstoppable from legacy to cloud, but the legacy remains. And for a lot of enterprises where there are regulatory issues or where a lot of the systems of record live in non-cloud IT systems, there has to be a way to preserve those, yet make the data available to other IT deployment models that are more flexible and more agile. And then what we're seeing from this slide is you can take a view of it that says, okay, the traditional in-house IT is declining, various types of cloud are on the rise. So doesn't that mean a big battle for leadership in the third platform? And you know, of course it does. These days in our society, everything is a battle, whether it's politics, whether it's the World Series, whatever. There's always a battle involved. But the question to ask here, when you're looking at the type of vendor you want to guide you through your cloud journey and your digital transformation journey is, is it all about the hyperscale guys? And I have another slide later in the presentation that says, no, it's not. They're part of the mix, but they're not the totality of the cloud. And then what does winning in the cloud mean? It, does it mean being the platform dominator? Does it mean having an ecosystem? Is it about the ability to provide custom integration and orchestration that reaches back to on-premise systems? You know, does it mean storefronts and back, 
backend aggregation. It means all of those things. If you're gonna be a player in the cloud space, you have to be able to do all of those things. And when you're looking for a provider to take you to the cloud, those are some of the key factors to look for. And finally, the hybrid cloud, or increasingly what we're calling it at IDC, is diversified IT environments. They're increasingly common, but there's still some work to be done as far as how do you do cross-platform networking? How do you do service management and orchestration across different deployment models? And then how do you do network access that's secure, dedicated, and high speed? For that reason, I was really glad to hear about some of Oracle's networking technologies, because increasingly having that secure high-speed link from your network to the various clouds that you use is gonna be a key factor in how agile and how flexible your diversified IT infrastructure is. And here's a little bit more data that's, that's more to give you a flavor for some of the challenges around hybrid IT or diversified IT environments. You ask 10 different people, what is hybrid IT? What does it mean to you? How are you implementing it? You'll get a bunch of different answers. But I think on the, on the left-hand side of this slide, the unifying principle here is hybrid is all about how do you have a common pool of application and IT infrastructure resource that can be called on on demand, can be mixed and matched with other types of applications, and you have a unified view of the whole thing. If you're an IT manager, you're a lot less worried about your end users being able to self-service and configure their own IT and application instances if you have a unified view of what's going on in your environment and you can apply security and governance policies to that self-service usage. And one data point I'd like to point out here is in our most recent survey, 64% of businesses, this isn't just enterprises, it's small, medium, large businesses in the US and worldwide are using some kind of hybrid IT model. So that's the wave of the future and part of the challenge for a lot of companies is how do we go into this hybrid cloud environment. And again, having a service provider who has the tools and the experience in all the, the deployment models is one way to get there. One other factoid I'd like to present here is that multi-cloud is the new normal in this world. And in our survey, we found that on average, people have 10 different cloud services that they're using right now and that number goes up to about 16 in the next couple of years. So more cloud is, is the rule and different types of deployment models, having to manage those together is what enterprises are all gonna have to do in the digital transformation era. And here's just a kind of a checklist when you're thinking about your IT environment and what it is you need it to do for you. And at the end of the day, there's a need to manage a lot of diverse resources and manage those on-prem and off-prem, connect them together, have different tools for data control, for resource usage, performance monitoring, security compliance, and have some guidance on how to deploy those workloads and how to manage them and also having security and visibility across the entire stack. And here's a very annoying build slide that I didn't know was a build until I got here today, but it's giving an idea of each of the different pieces of a hybrid IT environment. First, you have your on-premise, or in some cases, it's co-located in a third-party data center. You know, this is very familiar, and this is on the extreme end of the spectrum where you have a lot of control over the environment, direct control over that environment. And these are some of the advantages of, that this approach gives you. It's available to the extent that all the applications live in the data center, it's extremely low latency, 
and you have governance over the entire stack. Then here's another way of looking at cloud that I'm trying to move away from this whole idea of public cloud versus private cloud. I think a more interesting way of looking at cloud is to look at it in terms of the workload characteristics. So steady state cloud here, it could be a public cloud, it could be a private cloud, but the idea is that it's not an extremely dynamic environment. Think about it as next generation of managed hosting, where it's a known quantity as far as the workload goes, the capacity required, the number of users coming in. And what a steady state cloud gives you is a trusted environment for running a lot of critical internal applications is one good use case for a steady state cloud. And you have the operational efficiency of having exactly the capacity you need for the workload. You're not paying for more than you need, nor are you paying for the privilege of being able to spin up and spin down when that's not really what you have to do in that type of workload. And then there's not necessarily the migration issue that you're gonna put that workload in a steady state cloud and it's gonna stay there until the application gets replaced or until the application falls over and then has to be migrated to something new. And then on the last end of the spectrum, we have what we call variable cloud, which could be a hyperscale cloud like AWS or it could be something more along the lines of a virtual private data center or virtual private cloud. And the advantage here is that elasticity on the, compute, um, on the compute side, the ability to have geographic reach, you can have variable cloud instances in multiple geographies, and it's all automated. And it's dynamic in the sense that it can be spun up and spun down for dev tasks, for new production environments, and also replicated environments as the demand profile changes. And this is a slide I've been, I've been using for quite a few years now as a way to describe the different IT deployment models and the different approaches that companies and individuals within companies have towards IT. And the upshot of it is that one size does not fit all. And I use, it a, use a laundry analogy because I live in New York City and you can pay somebody to do everything for you in New York. So I'm way on the other side of do it for me. But I've lived in other places, other times in my life where I've had a washer dryer in my house. So I see that as the extreme DIY types who want to do everything themselves. They want to get exactly the washing machine they want and you know, they want to do their own clothes. They don't want anybody touching their stuff. So for those guys, the in-house or the enterprise on-site private cloud model is great for them because they get what they want in terms of owning and managing everything. But the problem there sometimes is that it's not flexible enough. You are kind of locked into what you've decided to buy and you're also locked into how many hours a day you feel like dealing with it. So then there's the other idea where the semi-DIYers, I think, can go to a laundromat. So they're using somebody else's stuff, but they're still doing the work themselves. And this is what we see a lot of people doing these days, but there's another issue with that, is that within organizations, you've got about 50% of those organizations saying, we don't have the headcount to teach everybody how to program and build applications on AWS. And also there's a lot of change and flux in cloud, and so they're changing best practices, changing standards, and a lot of enterprises are having to think, do we wanna spend our time having our people learn how to use a cloud, or do we wanna have them spend their time figuring out how do we modernize our business processes, how do we develop new applications for our customers. And so that takes you to what I call the managed cloud model, which is the whole idea of a laundry service where you have a bag of dirty clothes, somebody comes, picks them up, they come back a couple hours later with 
clean clothes that are all folded and you're ready to go to go out and do what it is that you do to create value. And believe me, I do not create value by doing laundry because everything turns pink. So the idea here is that if you're an enterprise and you're interested in the outcome of digital transformation, of interacting with your customers in a different way, innovating, iterating, then the cloud infrastructure is not necessarily what you want to spend your time worrying about, that you have something that's provider managed as kind of a third platform factory for you, and then you develop on top of that, where you add your value. And the interesting thing about this managed cloud model we're starting to see is that it's not just for the late adopters who said, no, 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 cloud is evil, and then five minutes ago they said, oh yeah, no, it's not. We're finding a lot of cloud native types who built their business on AWS or on Azure, and they're finding that the scale of it is making things really complex. And they're spending more time on the infrastructure than they are in the applications. So I think that there's a lot of scope in this market for companies of all types to look at this cloud business platform or laundry service model as a way to go about hybrid IT. And here's just a representation of IT deployment choices and cloud workloads. It's you know, a pretty simple way of looking at things, but I think for enterprises, it's a good way to start thinking about cloud. Like, what kind of workload are we talking about? What are the application characteristics? And also, what are the governance and data sovereignty characteristics? And pick your cloud this way and look for a provider who can support as many of those as possible. And just to wrap up, I wanted to mention that there's a new role for service providers in this, in this space these days, and it's as an IT facilitator. And the interesting thing is that as business moves from selling products to selling service and experiences around products, we're seeing the technology vendors become service providers as well. We're in this era where it's everything as a service, which translates into everybody as a service provider. So when you're looking at this kind of technology Sherpa sort of role for both service providers and vendors, what you need is a partner, not just somebody who's going to sell you stuff. Of course, stuff gets sold, but increasingly the stuff that's being sold is a service and not a piece of hardware and not lines of code. You need to have support across multiple IT deployment models and multiple cloud models too. The world is not just about cloud, not cloud. There are different types of cloud and there are different ways of connecting from on-prem to external clouds. Transition and migration assistance is key. You don't go from zero to cloud in 60 seconds. So there's the idea that somebody to help with the discovery, the planning, and design of that cloud transition, in addition to the runbook for cloud operations, is a key part of this journey to the cloud. And then finally, with cloud, it's all about continuous engagement and continuous dialogue. You don't set it and forget it with cloud. Business is dynamic. Digital transformation requires agility and speed, and the IT infrastructure has to reflect that as well. And one thing I want to leave you with here is when you're taking your journey into the cloud, it's not either or, it's not one size fits all. There are different models for different applications, different workloads, different regulatory environment. So having a provider who can stitch that all together and give you as many options as possible is definitely a, way, a good way to start on your journey to the cloud. And with that, I will exit the stage now because I'm already five minutes over, but thank you very much.